you know what we will do in this session is look at us the church and the crisis we are in in other words the church and the crisis of truth uh, I thought about how we could do this there were several approaches I could have taken look at the you know the various issues that we are facing and then try and respond to them uh, or at least try and work through a framework within which we could respond to them that could have been one way to do it um, but as I thought long and hard and I prayed about it I was very comfortable not taking that approach uh, and I was equally comfortable in doing what we are going to do now and that is look at a nation that went through that crisis and what God had to tell that nation through the prophet Micah and especially when that nation did not recognize that they were the reason for the problem so that's what we're going to look at yes we are in the midst of the crisis there is no questioning that but who is responsible for it and who can do anything about it is what we're going to look at so if you have your Bibles turn with me to Micah and we will begin with chapter 6 you know my hope is that even as we go through this book we'll be spending most of our time if not all of it in chapter 6 probably just a few verses maybe you know 6 to 8 but we look at the environment that occasioned this and in doing that my hope is that we will learn to let that question resonate in our heads and then response to that question order our lives with what shall I come before the Lord Micah 6 6 so church and the crisis of truth and I would urge you to remember Micah 6 6 look at how the prophet words this chapter 6 verse 1 hear now what the Lord is saying arise plead your case before the mountains and let the hills hear your voice listen you mountains to the indictment of the Lord and you o enduring foundations of the earth because the Lord has a case against your people even with Israel he will dispute my people what have I done you and how have I veered you answer me Indeed, I have brought you up from the land of Egypt and have ransomed you from the house of slavery and I sent you before you Moses, Aaron and Miriam. My people remember now what Balak, king of Moab, counseled and Balaam, son of Beor, answered him and from Shittim to Gilgal so that you might know the righteousness, the righteous acts of the Lord. what happened what happened to this nation that God himself as it were bore them out when they struggled in Egypt you read uh, Exodus and you read chapter 19 the chapter that precedes uh, the, uh, the, the that preceded the giving of the law God looks at Israel and he tells them I think this is verse 4 or 5 of chapter 19 He says you yourself have seen how I brought you out of Egypt I bore you on eagle's wings that's what he says to them and I find that imagery fascinating for two reasons I wondered why God used that image of an eagle carrying its young you know the eagle is probably the most fierce of the birds of prey you try you can try taking something that the eagle has captured out and you will know what that means it's also the most caring of the bird of prey of, of birds of prey 
the way it cares for its young and that's precisely what happened in in Egypt isn't it Egypt was torn to shreds as it were as God gently lifts Israel out that's what happened but then you come to a book like Micah and then you have the Lord almost pleading to the people over here he says arise you plead your case before the mountains let the hills hear your voice listen you mountains to the indictment of the Lord and you enduring foundations of the earth because the Lord has a case against his people even with Israel he will dispute and then speaking in the first person the Lord says my people what have I done for you how have I burdened you answer me we will never understand that until we see this from the vantage point of the people themselves and even as we consider the mess we are in may I suggest we do that with care the answer sometimes can be very scary but if you turn to the beginning of this book you will find that Micah he ministered you know he was almost like a transition prophet because uh, chapter 1 says the word of the Lord came to Micah of Moresheth in the days of Jotham Ahaz and Hezekiah kings of Judah what he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem Jotham by the way was Uzziah's son and if you have uh, an interest in the history of of Israel God's people you will go back and read the Chronicles and you will see that Uzziah's age or the time when Uzziah ruled was probably the golden era of Israel second only to Solomon in fact at some I uh, my personal view is that Uzziah's reign was a lot better than Solomon's because Solomon's reign was a burden for the people in building the temple and then spending twice the amount of time in building his own house he had brought that nation to bankruptcy Uzziah's age was a golden era Jotham was Uzziah's son so Micah probably grew up as a little kid at his Uzziah's reign he's seen the glory days of Israel now Jotham comes onto the scene and he goes with not just Jotham Jotham's son Ahaz and Hezekiah that's the whole deal and I and Micah follows Isaiah he, he started prophesying after Isaiah the prophet and Jeremiah followed Micah that's that's the sequence as it were in terms of the prophetic uh, period but you will see that if you carefully look at reconstructing the time period Micah ministered for ob probably 53 years you know between 53 to 55 years that's how long he ministered but that's not all as you look at this man's ministry which spanned over five decades you will find that he went from that golden age of Uzziah who was a proud person and pride was what brought his downfall to Jotham who was like his father but you know you will find that the people acted very wickedly because he did not care for the things of God to Ahaz Ahaz was extremely corrupt and Ahaz even went to the extent of sacrificing his own child and then Hezekiah came onto the scene and a revival broke out and by the time Hezekiah was through the nation was going to go into exile Hezekiah started praying tribute to the Assyrian king so that's the man that's why he's standing on one hand he grew up running around the streets of uh, the nation so to speak in its glory days 
and then as he starts his ministry he is troubled by what he is seeing because he is he saw the demise of this great king and his son walking in the same light jotham and he knows there's disaster and it's coming and then he sees the bankruptcy of this nation that one man single handedly plunges that nation into spiritual darkness and he sees how one man again brings about a restoration in hezekiah but he doesn't see hope for very long and that's probably why you will see this in the way it is written and all of what i just said you know it's chronicled for us in second chronicles was uh, i think it's in chapter 29 to 31 it's there that's the history of the land you have all of that over there but look at the way the people respond to god's question god says to them how have i troubled you what have i done to you and he gives them a two verse history lesson I brought you out from the land of Egypt didn't I I ransomed for you in the house of slavery didn't I I gave you spiritual leadership Moses Aaron Miriam didn't I When there was corruption I preserved you didn't I When the king of uh, or king of Moab Balak he counseled and Balaam he wanted to in some way give you away didn't I keep you don't you remember what i did for you in the days of joshua how i brought you from shittim to gilgal you have that huge history lesson and then a you know a postscript as it were which says so that you might know the righteous acts of the lord i did all of this for you israel i did this i kept you this is your history so that you would know the righteous acts of of my very being and then the people they look to god and they say with what shall i come before the lord and with what shall i bow myself before the lord on high you know if you stop there you'll almost think that here you have a people who are chastised by what the lord has to say to them you'll almost think that God has said all of this and then says tell us what do you want of us lord not quite if only they had done it in that way but not quite you see you look at the book let me take you uh, in you know give you a brief survey of the book you look that the problem that they are facing was a social problem they were facing an economic problem they were facing a political problem but that the heart of all of this the heart of this crisis was a spiritual problem look at verse 5 of chapter 1 Well, let me read from verse three. For behold, the Lord is coming forth from his place; he will come down and tread down the high places of the earth. The mountains will melt under him, and valleys will be split like wax before fire, like water poured out from a steep place. All this is for the rebellion of Jacob and for the sins of the household of Israel. What is the rebellion of Jacob? is it not samaria what is the high place of juda is it not jerusalem mica is laying the charge at the door of in our terms the church for everything that the nation was struggling with mica says spiritual leadership is responsible god's judgment god's judgment on the land 
was because of the failure of its spiritual leadership it doesn't just end there and then Micah goes on he talks about the destruction of Samaria he prophesies about it and he talks about the oppression that's going to come but what is really troubling is the way the people respond they respond to Micah only twice in this entire chapter in this entire book they respond only twice here's the first response in chapter 6 of in chapter 2 uh, verse 6 he says before uh, to them that no one stretching a measuring line for the Lord by lot in the assembly of for you by lot in the assembly of the Lord you will be completely destroyed he says to them if you do not change but they say to him verse 6 do not speak out so they say so they speak out but if they do not speak out concerning these things a reproach will not be turned back that's all they had to say to Micah don't say these things we don't care don't say it do not speak out but Micah says to them if you don't speak out reproaches will not be turned back what happened and as you continue into verse in chapter 2 when you look at verse 8 and 9 you will see that there has been abuse of power abuse of power by the spiritual leadership for personal gain my people have risen as an army you strip the robe of the garment from unsuspecting passerbys, from those unreturned from war. The women of my people you evict, everyone from her pleasant home, from her children you make my splendor forever. You've done it all, you've just taken it away. What I gave to my children, my people, says the Lord, you, the spiritual leadership, has just stripped it away for personal gain. It doesn't end there. Look at what he says in chapter 3. And I said, Hear now, heads of Jacob and the rulers of the house of Israel, it is, is it not for you to know justice? You who hate good and love evil, who tear off the skin from them and their flesh from their bones, you who eat the flesh of my people, strip off their skins from them, break their bones, chop them up as for the pot and as meat for the kettle. You know, when you walk down that road of abusing spiritual leadership, you will stop at nothing you will abuse power for personal gain and then it goes on that the inhuman treatment of people will follow prophets they selectively prophesied they interpreted the word of God uh, so that it would add up to their personal gain isn't that what verse 5 says thus says the Lord concerning the prophets who lead my people astray when they have something to bite with their teeth they cry peace but again, him who puts nothing in their mouths, they declare holy war. Micah says, the problem, the problem is spiritual leadership. When there is a crisis, let's not, before we look outside, let's learn to first look inside chances are the problem the reason for the problem is a lot closer than we think because if you look at verse 11 he says this her leaders pronounce judgment for a bribe her priests instructed for a price and her prophets divine for money you have a spiritual leadership whose rudder was money 
a spiritual leadership that was insistent in doing things their way and a spiritual leadership that did all this and then said isn't this the Lord's blessing upon us and uh, they learn to say this is not the Lord in our midst calamity will not come upon us is not the Lord in our midst who is responsible for the spiritual and you know fabric as it were the moral climate as it were of a community who who can be responsible for the moral condition of a society or a nation who is responsible for the mess we are in and I think if you were to get Micah to speak to you he would say one word and leave he would say church I want us to look at what he's saying very carefully because he is leveling these charges for a nation that's on the verge of destroying itself at the door of spiritual leadership he has seen it all he's seen the glory days he's seen he's seeing the trauma that they are living in and is is it is his hope that they would see it the way God wants them to see it so you see as he goes on he there is a promise of restoration in the birth of a Messiah a king who will be born in Bethlehem but then as he closes that in chapter 5 you find that he is declaring that this nation was inviting God's judgment upon themselves because of a perverted view of reality look at what he says in verses 10 to 13 of chapter 5 it will be in that day declares the Lord that I will cut off your horses from among you and destroy your chariots I will also cut off the cities of your land I will tear down your fortifications I will cut off sorceries from your land you will have fortune tellers no more I will cut off your carved images and your sacred pillars from among you so that you will no longer bow down to the work of your hands here is a nation that trusted and valued its horses and chariots more than the God who gave it to them. Here is a nation that took pride in its cities more than the God who established them in those cities. Here is a God, uh, here is a people who looked at sorcery and looked at humans telling them what to do when it is God who said I will be your God and you will be my people here is a group of people and a nation who wants to worship the work of their own hands when God tells them that you are my handmaiden you are my handiwork the reason why any nation inches towards bankruptcy politically socially or economically is because first it has become bankrupt spiritually turn with me to Deuteronomy I want to read for you a chapter in the book I think it's important for us to hear it Deuteronomy chapter 8 when God talks about or when Moses talks about the commandments that he's given to them He's telling them why all the commandments that I have commanding you today you shall be careful to do that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swore to give to your forefathers 
you shall remember all the ways which the Lord your God has led you in the wilderness these 40 years that he might humble you testing you to know what was in your heart whether you would keep his commandments or not he humbled you and let you be hungry and fed you with manna which you did not know about nor did your fathers know that he might make you understand that man does not live by bread alone but man lives by everything that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord your clothing did not wear on you nor did your foot swell these forty years thus you are to know in your heart that the Lord your God was disciplining you just as a man disciplines his son therefore you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God to walk in his ways and to fear him for the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land a land of brooks of water of fountains and springs flowing forth in the valleys and hills a land of wheat and barley of wines and fig trees and pomegranates a land of olive and of olive oil and of honey a land where you will eat food without scarcity in which you will not lack anything a land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills you can dig copper when you have eaten and are satisfied you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land which he has given you beware that you do not forget the Lord the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments and ordinances and his statutes which I am commanding you today otherwise otherwise when you have eaten and are satisfied and have built good houses and have lived in them when your herds and your flocks multiply and your silver and gold multiply and all that you have multiplies then your heart will become proud and you will forget the land uh, the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery he led you through the great and terrible wilderness with its fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty ground where there was no water he brought water forth from a rock of flint in the wilderness he fed you with manna which your fathers did not know that he might humble you that he might test you to do good for you in the end otherwise you would say in your heart my power and the strength of my hand made me this wealth but remember the Lord your God for it is he who is giving you the power even to make wealth that he may confirm his covenant which he has swore to your fathers as it is this day now here is the warning if shall come about if you ever forget the Lord your God and go after other gods and serve them and worship them I testify against you today that you will surely perish like the nations that the Lord made to perish before you so you shall perish because you would not listen to the voice of the Lord a nation that values its horses and chariots more than the Lord who gives them that a nation that values its cities more than the Lord who has helps him establish those cities a nation that values the worship of their handiwork when God says to them you are the work of my hands that nation is on the verge of destruction spiritual bankruptcy is at the heart of every crisis social political economic whichever way you look at it so the question you and I need to ask and answer for ourselves is this who is responsible for the social communal fabric 
which is to somehow bring into it the morality of God. Who is responsible for the spiritual climate? With what shall I come before the Lord? And bow myself before the Lord on high. Shall I come to him with burnt offering? Shall I come to him with a year old calf? Does the Lord take delight in thousands of rams and ten thousands of oils? In ten thousand rivers of oil? These are all Levitical prescriptions. But you see, they did not intend to come before God expecting that He would in some way reveal His righteousness to them. They were standing and saying to God, You know God, we've been there, we've done that. Shall I present my firstborn for my rebellious acts? the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul. Leviticus makes it very clear. Chapter 18. Yes, chapter 18. I think it's verse 20 or 21. It makes it very clear. You shall not cause your children to go through the fire as the people of this land do. Shall I give up my son? In fact, that's what the leadership did. It's important for us to recognize at the heart of what God demands of us is not the act of worship, but the heart of worship. Because if the act of worship is the only thing you and I hold on to, we will degenerate so fast and so badly that we would not even recognize the difference between worship and the perversion of it. And we will even have the audacity to ask God, Am I not doing all of this for you? What else do you want? Does the Lord take delight in thousands of rams and ten thousand rivers of oil? Shall I present him with the firstborn of for my rebellious acts, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O man. I think that's probably the most sternest of responses you would have heard. Where God, who is pleading to the people in the first five verses, as it were, tell me what have I done wrong to you, turns round and now instead of pleading, he's pronouncing a judgment. So I've told you. You know. It's not information that you lack. You know. And to the credit of this nation, there was a man who turned it around. He was King Hezekiah. And if you look at Second Chronicles, and if you turn to chapter 29, we look in brief, we'll pick up brief verses from chapter 29 to 31, and we look at three things that he does which actually brings a nation back to God. The first thing that comes to us comes to us in the first 11 verses of chapter 29. You see what he does. He sends an invitation to all of Israel, to every one of them to come. He says, come, let us worship God. The first thing Hezekiah does is that he restores worship to its rightful place. Not restrict it to the privateness of his own heart. The crisis of truth 
needs to find its answer in worship and the worship of a community of God as a community of God that's the first thing Hezekiah does he takes the the people together he gathers them together and he brings them to worship God but that's not the only thing he does look at chapter 30 and let me read for you a few verses from chapter 30 turn with me to second Chronicles chapter 30 and I'm going to read for you verses 18 downwards you know there was he just ushered in such a huge revival that people from everywhere were coming in and they had to sacrifice to the Lord there was so much I mean they pre they pretty much went on a sacrifice spree at that moment they ran short of hands qualified hands as it were to sacrifice so the lay people got into the act of sacrificing on behalf of the people of the land now that's a serious offense in according to the Levitical prescription there is only one kind of people who can offer sacrifice to the Lord the priest but then you had to do it so there were people who came from everywhere and look at verse 18 of chapter 30 for the multitude of people even many from Ephraim from Manasseh from Ishaka from Zebulun had not purified themselves yet they ate of the Passover other than the way it was prescribed so you had the sacrifices go on on a you know on an uncontrollable on one end and you have the people over here there's such a mood of revival that's been whipped up over here that the entire Levitical prescription is going out of the window but here is a man who not only understood what it was to restore worship to its original place in other words he was a person who brought worship back into its to its rightful place he redeemed worship from being a mere ceremonial observation look at his prayer they just did what they wanted to do they did not purify themselves they practiced they participated in the Passover but he prays for them Hezekiah prayed for them saying may the good Lord pardon everyone who prepares his heart to seek God the Lord God of his fathers though not according to the purification rules of the sanctuary please Lord we are in desperate need of you we are so desperate that we can't even hold on till we do what is prescribed to us will you forgive us you see we often forget that God gave us his commandments so that we will know him we would love him and we will walk in that knowledge of him so that he will be glorified what have we done with those we make his commandments God in themselves that was Jesus's biggest problem when he was dealing with the Pharisees that they have made the law God by itself that was Paul's biggest problem when he was writing to the Galatian church telling them you who have been redeemed by Christ why are you so quick to desert him and fall back as it were these are not New Testament prescriptions here you have a man who restored worship to its rightful place you have a man who redeemed worship from being a mere ceremony and look at how God responds verse 20 so the Lord heard Hezekiah and healed the people the Lord heard Hezekiah and healed the people it did not stop there look at what follows if you read 
chapter 31 and verse 1 when they finished all of this you should remember that Hezekiah was Ahaz's son Ahaz had single-handedly plunged that nation into spiritual darkness to the extent that he sacrificed his own son on the altar that's how corrupt the nation was that's how bankrupt they were spiritually look at what Hezekiah had done he takes them and in verse 31 after they finish their you know participation in the Passover meal when they had finished all Israel who were present went out into the cities of Judah they broke their pillars into pieces cut down the asherim they pulled down the high places and the altars throughout Judah and Benjamin and well as in Ephraim and Manasseh until they had destroyed them all then the sons of Israel returned to their cities each to his possession you see when worship is restored not just as a ceremonial observation when worship of the living God is restored the spiritual fabric of the nation will be mended again because they went out they brought down everything that caused this problem for them every asherim every high place everything that led them into being a morally and spiritually bankrupt nation with their own hands as a people restored back to God they brought it down that's very similar to what the people did in Ephesus when they were confronted with the gospel of Jesus they brought all their scrolls which was worth hundreds of thousands of millions of dollars billions if you want in today's term burnt it all up to borrow Paul's words they counted it all worth nothing rubbish for the cause of Christ everything that the nation had set up that spoke against God that drew them away from God with their own hands they brought it down the people tore down every high place justice as you will see is not something you and I are called to relegate or outsource to political leadership or a non-governmental organization you know O oh man was God's response he has told you what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice to love kindness and to walk humbly before your God the only way anyone can ever offer hope is if it finds its source in the Lord who has the authority to give that hope that's the only way walking humbly before God only in that will you be able to extend kindness one to another and it's only in that context will justice be meted you see justice is a social problem it finds its answer in the spirituality of the community in them walking humbly before God the nation was heading towards bankruptcy economically the priests had literally robbed the people of everything that the Lord had blessed them with the answer to the economic problem 
can be found only when the people had their spiritual life restored. And as you pay attention to this, you will find that at the heart of what God is telling them is pay attention to my word. I have told you, O oh man. You know it. I have told you. You don't need a fresh revelation. You only need to turn a few pages. Turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 4. Look at what God tells them. Now, O Israel, listen to the statutes and the judgments which I am giving you, which I am teaching you to perform, so that you may live and go on and take possession of the land which the Lord, the God of your fathers, is giving you. You shall not add to the word which I am commanding you, nor take away from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. Your eyes have seen what the Lord your God did in the case of Baal Peor. For all men who followed Baal Peor, the Lord your God had destroyed them from among you. But you, who held fast to the Lord, are alive today, every one of you. See, I have taught you the statutes and judgments, just as the Lord my God commanded me that you should do thus in the land you are entering to possess. So keep them, do them, for that is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of all the people who will hear of these statutes and say, Surely this is a great nation and these are such wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God so near as is the Lord our God whenever we call on him? Or what great nation is there that has statutes and judgments as righteous as this whole law which I am setting before you today? Only give heed to yourself and keep your soul diligently so that you will not forget the things which your eyes have seen and that you do not depart from that, that it does not depart from your heart all the days of your life, but make them known to your sons and grandsons. Make them known. Make them known. What nation is there on the face of the earth which has a God or a revelation as this? You know why we are in this mess. You know. I know. We even know what to do about it. The question is, will we? You see, I have come to the conclusion. If the word of God is missing in a Christian home, it's the parent's biggest failure and the child's greatest loss. If the word of God is missing in a Christian home, it's the parent's biggest failure and the child's biggest loss. Think about it. What are the consequences if the word of God is missing in a community, in society, in this nation? If the word of God is not present in the nation, it does not have an option other than bankruptcy. You know the problem is so bad that when Micah actually reflects on it in chapter 7 he says we are going to be so miserable that you don't have to look outside to find your enemy. Your own household members will turn on you. Woe is me, for I am like a fruit 
picker says well, chapter 7 like the grape gatherer there is not a cluster of grape to eat or the first ripe fig which I crave the godly person has perished from the land and there is no upright person among men all of them lie in wait for bloodshed each of them hunt the other with a net concerning evil both hands do it well the prince asks also the judge for a bribe the great man speaks the desire of his soul so they weave it all together the best of them is like a briar the most upright of them like a thorn hedge the day when you post your watchmen your punishment will come then their confusion will occur do not trust in a neighbor do not have confidence in a friend for her who lies in, a, in your bosom guard your lips the son will treat his father with content. The daughter will rise up against her mother. The daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies are men from within his own household. The day is not too far. If the voice of God is missing in a nation, the day is not too far when the enemies of man will be from within his own household but Micah doesn't end there and thankfully because he offers us hope because that's the hope the Lord wants to offer us because he says all of this and then in verse 7 he says but as for me I will watch expectantly for the Lord I will wait for God the God of my salvation my God will hear me my God will hear me that is our hope that is our hope and that is why in spite of us being in a crisis we still can call out to him in spite of the fact that we ourselves had authored this crisis we can call out to him because what Micah is telling us is that we have a God who hears us not only is a God who hears us, He is a light for us in our deepest darkness. Look at verse 8. Do not rejoice over me, O my enemy. Though I fall, I will rise. Though I dwell in darkness, the Lord is a light for me. Though I have created this for my own self, I have hope because He will rescue me isn't that what he tells the nation that I will take you by the hand and I will lead you isn't that what he promises through Jeremiah I will take out their heart of stone and I will put in them a heart of flesh I will write my words in their heart we have a God who is not only a God who hears but we have a God who is our light in our darkness and verse 9 he says he is a God who will forgive us and he will cause us to see his righteousness I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him until he pleads my case and executes justice for me he will bring me out to the light and I will see his righteousness and finally Micah brings this letter to a close or this book to a close what he has to say to the nation by offering them the hope the only hope that we all have it is this who is a God like you in fact that's what the word Micah or Mikayu in Hebrew means who is like Yahweh Who is a God like you who pardons iniquity, passes over the rebellious acts of the remnant of his possession? 
he does not remain or retain his anger forever because he delights in unchanging love. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. Yes, you will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. So you have a God, I have a God, you worship this God, I worship this God who hears us. We have a God who is our light in our deepest, darkest moments. And He is a God who will forgive us and cause us to see His righteousness. Only, only if we are prepared to say, Lord, by your word, we will live. Because he is a God who delights in restoring us. Who can be responsible for the moral fabric of a society? I think the church is the only entity that can be responsible. Who can offer hope in this time of crises, I think only we can. Let us never forget, at the heart of any crisis, social, economic, political, whatever it is, is a spiritual crisis. Let's look to God in prayer. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name, and we thank you, Lord, that you are a God who loves us with an everlasting love and you are a God who draws us by your loving kindness so we come to you Lord as a people who desire to be your people and we come to you also as a people who desperately struggle to be your people so we pray O oh Lord that you will hear us for who is there like you who loves us and who will redeem us we pray Lord that you would set us free to live for the praise of your glory for we pray this in Jesus name Amen